Okay, welcome everybody to uh, the SFU Sports Analytics Virtual Seminar Series, Episode 9. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Ming Shang Tsai uh, from the Canadian Sport Institute Pacific to talk to us about data solutions process in high performance sport. So Dr. Tsai is the performance and data science uh, scientist, excuse me, and the lead for biomechanics and performance analysis at the Canadian Sport Institute Pacific. He has an undergraduate degree in engineering science, a master's degree in aerospace engineering, and a PhD uh, in exercise physiology. So Ming is a former elite athlete uh, in rowing, and then I don't know if he considers his triathlon career elite, but I think he was probably pretty darn good. Um, so uh, he's passionate about high performance sports, and he finds it exciting to uh, be involved with national teams again and contribute to, uh, to their progress in a different way. The knowledge he gained through both being an athlete and a researcher has enabled him to bring an evidence-based approach to his coaching. So he also coaches athletes on the side and uh, has produced success in elite athletes he has trained. His unique combination of technical and physiology knowledge and experience in high performance sport as an athlete and as a coach aids him in assisting NSOs or national sport organizations. So these people, these would be individuals such as high performance directors, coaches, and practitioners in incorporating sports analytics as one of the most important performance and game decision-making tools. So today he is going to uh, talk to us about the following topics. So sport data consists of technical or tactical information from practice or competition or data from regular testing monitoring across many sports science and medicine disciplines. The pathway of data starts with collection in the daily training environment and proceeds to analytics and then the reporting necessary to support NSO technical leaders. This process requires professional handling of data at all stages to ensure evidence-based decisions can be made on valid and reliable data and data science processes. So this is the third of three talks focused on Canadian high performance sport, in particular the workflows of data analytics. So for the students in the audience, uh, I highly encourage you, if you want to work in this field, to uh, you know to, to to listen carefully to today's talk and also review Phil Jevtovic's talk from uh, about a month ago and then Justin Detlor's talk from two weeks ago, and it gives you a good landscape of and of how sports analytics is done in the in the real world, so to speak. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Ming, and if Ming, you just I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and if you can please share yours. Uh, uh, so I'll uh, turn it over to you and look forward to your talk. All right. Um, can, can you see my screen? Yeah, so you're on your presenter mode right now. Uh, it was just on your... Uh, like just the, the the one slide there. Oh, okay. Um, how do I get out of this? Am I still sharing right now? Yep. So uh, we can see your like just the, the power, slide. your PowerPoint. Um, view yeah so when you put it into slide the, this this mode so I, we can see like your next slide and any notes that you made so you might want to um uh try there you go that's there we go that works okay <clears throat> all right um so yeah thanks a lot for uh inviting me to this uh talk it's uh it's always great to share how um, how we uh, you know in high performance sport how we uh, work with data and it's uh, you know and it's a whole process and whole workflow. So uh, and uh, so just like Dave uh, said earlier, I'm the lead for uh, biomechanics and performance analysis at the Canadian Sport Institute uh, Pacific. I'm also the lead for the uh, performance sciences uh, data science uh, discipline at the uh, High Performance Advisory Council with the uh, own the podium. And it's an, uh, yeah, and so that's an initiative that uh, I think uh, that Dave is part of as well and that we both um, work together uh, closely in this data science uh, discipline to try to <clears throat> upskill the um, sports, Canadian sports uh, data literacy. 
So just a quick background for those who doesn't who don't know what the uh, you know, Canadian Sport Institute is is um, we're just part of a network network of an uh, institute that um, services the national team. There are three centers and four institutes and uh, spread across the across the country. And I'm part I'm with the Pacific, which we have three campuses: one in uh, Victoria, one in Whistler, and uh, one in Vancouver. So in today's uh, talk, I want to just mainly focus on our, you know, the workflow of the uh, our, our data, you know, solutions, where uh, you know it goes from uh, obviously goes from the data collection side of things, where we're on the ground collecting data from uh, different sport to how we process, and uh, and so in that area. Th that area we we you know we recognize it as uh as the uh, data management side of things and uh and a lot of times in uh high performance or or in a lot of, like the current um uh, climate that we a lot of times people will collect process the data and then we'll generally present the data and uh to to the decision makers and so that's something that we're trying to, you know, uh, bring about the, um, to try to educate the practitioners to, to that, to maybe look a little bit further and, and dig a little bit deeper and trying to look into validation and trying to model. So because a lot of data that you, we collect or extract from, from the, uh, you know, whatever, either the sensors or um, the tests, metrics may not be validated so thinking about just being trying to be validated and then trying to do some uh, uh, statistical testings or model it to get uh, some maybe more insightful uh result that we can present and so these are the three main areas that we uh have I, you know we really try to we have identified that really uh I guess really uh, pin the you know the, our solution data solution uh, workflow, which is the man management analytics and visualization. So in the management, like I said uh, earlier, it's about the collection when when you're on the uh, uh, on on the ground collecting with the team and things that needs to be realized is that this, the protocols of your collection has to be standardized. Right, and uh, and so that means knowing the tools, if it's validated, and if, even if it's the tool is sensitive enough to uh, to detect the changes that you are trying to uh, trying to to to, to, to trying to, to observe, right? And so, and knowing also the uh, the equipment limitations when when you're using these different equipments. Um, so, so that those are those, and you know, and as well as just the, the different workflow in how you collect these data, and so these has to be standardized so that we can, we 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 have a very you know we have a clean data set so that we can use later, for uh, you know to be able to do some analysis on or some an analytics on right, and uh, and so once you collect it, there is the management side of things where a lot of the uh, sports will use different databases. Some may be uh, centralized, some may be just um, you know, localized in their own computers, right? And uh, so there's got to be, again, a standardized way in trying to record your data so that when we merge them later, then it'll, you know, it'll be a, a lot more effect effective way or a more efficient way of doing things. So, so again, trying to understand the best way to, to manage, manage the data set, how you record it, how you store it, is, is another way that I know, another place where we need to try to standardize this uh, data collection side of things. And once you, let's say once you have the collection side of, uh, you know, a workflow done, next is about processing that. As you guys know, 
working with uh, real life data, there's going to be a lot of cleaning. For example, you know, things like, uh, like just like the dates. There, there could be different ways of people putting in dates, you know, different formats. And so just uh, trying to, you know, there's missing data, outliers, things like that. So there are the ways that we have to, you know, that we got to, you know, look into that and in processing the data and cleaning it. Again, as mentioned, the data can also come from many different sources, different, different sensors, different, um, different uh, even systems, right? Different places. So just trying to sometimes merge or sync them could be very time consuming. And uh, yeah, and so that, that is somewhere, that's a place that we need to also place a lot of care into trying to, uh, you know, standardize these protocols or, or just uh, be upskill enough to be able to do, do that uh, efficiently. And lastly, uh, this is, uh, I think this is less mentioned uh, when I listen to a lot of the, the you know, pe people talk about processing data is, they definitely all, always mention about the data wrangling side of things, but in sport, there is also a lot of like this, you know, trying to, 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 trying to de determine or calculate these um, sports specific metrics. And the, that's you no, know, and a lot of that is because we're dealing with different sports and, and, you know, or even coaches have different philosophies and they want to look at metrics, you know, that will reflect their, you know, try to reflect their, coaching philosophy or, or some sort like that. And so that means we have to go in there and try to really try to determine what metrics can really reflect the, you know, or you know, trying to uh, try to understand the different objectives that we are trying to try to capture. Right. And so try, try to try to determine that is sometimes, you know, uh, there's a, you know, a lot of uh, effort putting into that and trying to you know, quantify that. And so just for example, uh, a few examples I want to give you is, let's say, looking at biathlon, where uh, it consists of uh, cross-country skiing and uh, shooting. And so in order to, to capture a sports-specific metric, one of the you know, sports-specific metrics in this uh, sport is we can look at the steadiness of your shooting, right? And uh, and also, uh, you know, by doing that, then what we need to do is, of course, capture the movement of your rifle when you, you know, just when you, you know, before you shoot, and then you know, the moment after you uh, take the shot. And so, quantifying that, and you know, plotting it, you know, uh, looking at the actual uh, trajectory, allow us now to do a more in-depth analytics relating this steadiness, for example, to um, accuracy, right? And so it is really important for us to be able to, you know, capture these sports uh, specific metrics to allow us to do analytics later on properly. And, uh, and so this is something I think uh, sometimes I have to remind a lot of uh, practitioners is paying a, a lot of attention to trying to make sure we capture these sports uh, specific metrics accurately. <clears throat> Another metrics that uh, we have been doing with the para-athletics is looking at, let's say, a push profile during their, uh, during their the testings or, or different, you know, uh, push profile at different intensities to, to be able to pull out a, a lot more information than just, uh, global variables such as, uh, let's say, speed, or, uh, you know, um, and generally that's, that's all the, the, you know, the, the, the sport gets. It's just, oh, how, how fast are they going? And um, what is the time split at a certain checkpoint, right? But now with, uh, with some technology like, you know, that I will mention, you know, I will go into later on, we're able now to actually be able to look at the actual push mechanics at a really high detail resolution. Uh, so, so we can actually differentiate when they are, uh, you know, when they're testing, when they're fresh, or when they're during um, middle of the, the different set, or when they're extremely tired, or 
even at different intensities to look at, to, to really trying to determine what is the optimal um, uh, push profile for, for this individual. So as you can see, quantifying this allows us later to do analytics on, uh, to look at more insights. The next area I want to talk about is the, uh, obviously, you know, in that, in that workflow is the analytics side of things where the first part is we're working with, we're being approached or you know, work with a lot of different technologies, whether that could be in, you know, a, a new equipment that, uh, you know, that's off the shelf or is a new technology that we have to investigate or do, you know, trying to validate, or even a new app that people are using. We need to remember that, you know, we need to validate this against some gold standard, right? Before we can truly trust the data that's being generated from these technologies. And that's the same thing with the metrics as well. Like the, the, the sports specific metrics that I talked about earlier, a lot of these metrics that you pull out needs to be validated as well before we can really do analytics on, uh, on, on, on these data. Otherwise, without validation, then it's hard to know if you're act, you know, to know what the noise or the error of, of these technology or metrics that you, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're getting. And, uh, and then without knowing that, it's really hard to, to know if, if you're either your model or your, uh, your 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 uh, analysis is truly accurate because you haven't factored in the uh, you know you you don't understand the true true error uh, of your data, right? So once you validate these uh, different metrics and technologies, next is where of course then we can go into doing a lot more um, analytics work and more in depth analytic work and you know and this is where I think. This is the fun part, I think, and especially in this pop, you know, with this group, you know, being the sports analytic uh, group. Um, I think in, in sports field, we, like I mentioned earlier, is that we, 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 we spend, you know, I think we primarily spend our time in the descriptive analytics and, uh, and then we try to make insight, you know, trying to make decisions and, and uh, or inferences based on that, which is, as we know, we, we, we can't and we shouldn't based on descriptive data, there's gotta be some um, more work done in uh, with these, uh, it's great for exploratory, but then there's gotta be a next step on doing more and more testing, more modeling before we can make some inference, right? And so in, in, in this, uh, in this uh, figure, the X axis is the, you know, is the complexity of the different analytics uh, stages and the Y axis is the, the contribution, how valuable, these and you know these uh, analytics um, phases are to the to 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 the uh, you know usefulness of to inform decision, and as you can see, descriptive analysis is great. We need to do that. We need to you know uh, try to understand, get a good sense of what it is, but it doesn't give us a lot of value, right? And you know, and diagnostic is great as well. And, and you can, as you can imagine, diagnostic and descriptive are done on usually on the past data. And then we're trying to make some, uh, you know, trying to understand what, ha what happens or trying to, trying to make, you know, trying to do some comparisons or whatever based on the past data. The pre predictive and prescriptive is where, you know, we're trying to make informed decisions or make some predictions about the future that we know things that we want to do. And so, uh, and, and then that's where you, you make, you know, you can see a lot of more value added within these two uh, latter areas. And of course, and, you know, that comes with more complexity and more, uh, more things that you can do, get into like in with, uh, with machine learning, right? So, so that's a nice, uh, nice figure to give us a good understanding of different stages of analytics that we need to go through. Visualization is the last pillar in uh, this workflow, and that can come in the form of just uh, a report. And this is generally what is done in the sport in our system right now is um, 
a lot of times is done by discipline in a silo where if let's say physiologists go and do the testing, they will generate their own report and provide that to the coaches or you know the athletes. And the same thing with either bio, uh, biomechanics and performance analysis or nutrition or mental performance or, or you know, strength and conditionings, coaches, all these different disciplines will do their own testing and then provide the um, reporting to directly to the coaches and stuff. However, we are trying, you know, another way that I think could be a lot more beneficial and also trying to, you know, uh, incorporate all the discipline together is by having a dashboard, right? You know, and, and, and having all these data centralized so that we can start looking into the relationship or you know, association between different disciplines as well, right? And, and this also allows us, uh, allows the coaches or practitioners or uh, athletes to access the, the data remotely from anywhere. And, uh, and you know, with obviously with uh, different permissions given, right? Uh, this is just an example that um, from the a project that we, we did with, um, with SFU with Dave and uh, in Soccer Canada, looking at, and, and this, for example, is the uh, tactical data that uh, you know, they're able to generate after each game and to provide insights for, uh, for, for Soccer Canada's uh, you know, uh, tactical team uh, or analysts, right? So, and, that, and that's great. And so, our, our, you know, what we're trying to push from, uh, you know, at least at the Institute right now is trying to, trying to, you know, move away from having each practitioner having their own, uh, let's say, individual Excel sheets and, uh, and, you know, working hope with, you know, not to mention working with a whole bunch of different versions of Excel files to somewhere that's more centralized. Ideally, it's somewhere, you know, uh, cloud-based or online, but at least for now, trying to centralize that, you know, at the very least in one location locally, somewhere, you know, uh, managed by, uh, you know, somebody on, on a localized place. And, um, and so that, that allows us, uh, you know, again, standardize uh, uh, the workflow or the effort, the data management side of things. Hey Ming, uh, do you mind if I just ask a question uh, from the audience? So Chris Napier asks, do you have any specific recommendations for software to visually analyze? Uh, and he puts in parentheses, high level data. Um, I think um, for, for us, uh, I can only comment for us. Uh, I mean, there, there are a lot of softwares out there, right? There's you know, Power BI or Tableau and they, they're, they're been, they're, and they've been, uh, they're great to, uh, for visualization. Um, so, so I think uh, those, are, those are good tools to use, but you know, for us, we, we tend to, we were using a lot of like just more custom made uh, dashboards using R, Shiny, or, or even using Python to try to create that and try to customize it for the sport. And so, um, and that's generally our, you know, where we, 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 we are, how we're doing things. But of course, like it really depends on on how the, the sport, right, and how uh, they their current workflow, and what we're trying to do is trying to minimize changing things too much for them, right, so, and, and trying to trying to make sure that we try to keep the way that the, the things currently is, and uh, and you know slowly change their the dashboarding to something that's uh, more efficient. If, if, if there is, you know, if we can see a way to do that. But if it's, if it's already a nice workflow, then we, we generally try to just maintain whatever it is that they're doing. So I'm not sure if I answered that question, but that's, uh, at least that's uh, what our workflow is. Chris says, Chris says great, thanks. Okay, great. So um, in the next part, I'm, I wanna talk, just like try to, you know, Give you guys some examples of the the different research um, projects that we have been involved in uh, at the institute. Obviously, we have uh, you know there there is a lot there are a lot of different areas that we uh, are you know we we 
working uh, in terms of research projects. But uh, and so, but then, so I want to just really touch up, touch on this one area, like sensor technology that we have been uh, spending quite a bit of time on, and there's a lot of projects in there, you know, in that area, and it's uh, to me at least, I think it's really quite exciting, and uh, and it's uh, and it opens the door to so many different areas and uh, in into every discipline, like you know, uh, SNC or or uh, the geology or any other discipline. So that um, you no, know, so I want to touch up, touch a little bit on the different projects relating to IMUs. Just before I go into these projects, I want to just uh, briefly just you know talk about what IMU is. It's um, it's called the Inertia Movement Unit, and it's just like a little tiny unit consists of three sensors: accelerometer that measures the linear movement, acceleration of linear movement in x, y, and z. There's gyroscope that measures the uh, rotational speed of the uh, again in x, y, and z, and then there's magnetometer which measures the heading. Of uh, you know of, of of the Earth frame, and so from that you can you know you you can sample this at a very high uh, you know frequency and a high resolution. You can go from twenty five hertz, so twenty five times a second, to eight hundred and even more, right? And so you can imagine with such a high resolution, now we can actually see a lot of the movement that a lot of times we can't see from just looking at the GPS, right? GPS, as far as, uh, you know, we know like these really high-end GPS samples at maybe 10 hertz, 10 times a second. Running watches like Garmin, Sunto, they samples at one hertz, so one per second. So as you can imagine, if you are dealing with sports that is fast movement, like again, wheelchair sport, the wheels are turning at a very, very high speed, or let's say freestyle sport, snowboard, you know, all these different um, uh, big airs or slope styles. So they do a lot of uh, flips and turns, half pipe, let's say, uh, you know, looking at even at gymnastics, diving, figure skating, all these different freestyle sport doing a whole bunch of tricks. These movements last between one to two seconds. So if you're using your traditional um, GPS, you're only going to get one or two points per second. However, if you're using IMUs, you, you can imagine you can get a lot more you know, high resolution data uh, to be able to quantify these movements, right? Uh, we use it for indoor sport where GPS just won't work because there's no signal, right? There is uh, sports specific movements. For example, let's say if you want to capture. Um, karate on a punch, then we can put a sensor on the club. Then you can actually capture the, the speed of the punch, for example, or cross country skiing. You want to capture what is the movement in the upper body, lower body. Each one of these sensors can be placed at different location to, to do that. Um, these sensors are really tiny, really small. It's the size of, um, let's say, Looney. That's it. And they're very light. That's why it allows us to be able to to capture uh, different you know, uh, data at different moment, uh, movements at different locations. Another way that we use this um, sensor now is because it's so small and it can be easily deployed to all the different athletes, right? Um, especially with times like this now in COVID. Nobody is coming into a, a training camp or, 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 or um, you know, or some, uh, this gathering easily so now we you know making making monitoring of their performance a bit harder now we can actually do that by sending these little tiny sensors to them trying to have them do them at home share the data and we can do the analysis and then provide them feedback on, on their you know either the fitness progress as you can saw, you know, see earlier let's say the push profile and all the other different things, right? So, so it's a, these are different ways that we're using it and we're looking into, you know, uh, and it's part of a, a lot of our uh, research projects. And uh, 
one of the projects. So I want to talk a few few projects that we're you know, not 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 you know that we're doing uh, with the IMUs. Um, one of them is looking at uh, wheelchair technology, right right now is uh, which is indoor, and then you know there's no real way of trying to capture you know a bunch of different metrics like there's there's speed, the distance. There's no way to capture that other than you know using IMUs, and so. There's been few studies that have been done using IMUs on three on a wheelchair with uh, three IMUs, one on the frame, two on the wheel, and they do that in uh, they look into different agility, trying to look at uh, you know different rotational speed and actual linear speed and time and distance and all that you know uh, metrics, and so the, one of the questions is now how many sensors do we really need? Do we really need all three? Or could, could we get away with using one only? And that's one, that's one, that was the project that we're trying to, you know, we're, we're doing. And, uh, and this is what we've done is uh, the, you know, the results from it is that the black line is the one IMU and the red is the three IMU, which we, use, we, we consider as the gold standard. And, uh, and as you can see from the, uh, just the profile, there's one of the profile, it maps quite well, right? And uh, doing the Ben Altman um, analysis on the, the graph on the right, as you can see, pretty much all the um, points are within the agreement, limits of agreement, except for maybe one, right? There's one or maybe two for this, for the, uh, rotational speed. There's one there and one is just, just outside. Otherwise, as you can see, it's quite well uh, in agreement you know, between the three and one IMU. And this is, again, our validation of our one IMU uh, metrics to the three IMU. Next, uh, another one, uh, pro one of the projects I want to highlight is the using IMU to automatically detect and classify snow, snowboard tricks. This is just uh, you know, just quickly going through the uh, the methods. Is you know, you capture it from the sensors are placed on the on the boot. You capture the sensor. The sensor will capture all the data. You know, you put it on. You turn it on before they go out at the chalet. You you take it at the end of the day. So you're gonna get a lot of noise and you no know, noisy data. Right, and so the first step is to detect where the jumps are, and then you merge all the different files. There's, uh, you know, sens sensor fusion, merging the accelerometer, the uh, gyro, and the magnetometer. Next is to detect the windows. Uh, you know, once you once you have detected the jumps, then we, you know, we have we we have a w jump the window detection to tr tr try to help us calculate the metrics to classify the jumps. And so with jump detection, you know, there's, uh, we use the, uh, the cat boost classifier for those who are interested to know. And uh, we have the recall and precision, uh, you know, uh, essentially the jump accuracy is uh, there. And as, as you can see, our recall is quite accurate at 95%, right? So, uh, and, and the precision of that is uh, maybe not as accurate, but it's still at a really high level at, you know, 73 for the, for the test set. And once we can detect the jumps, now we want to, you know, trying to classify the, uh, the, 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 the different tricks. And uh, what we have done is trying, you know, we first calculate the, the rotational, essentially resultant rotational so it's just uh, combining the other three axes, axes of the, uh, the jump. And, uh, and then we, you know, we use random force to uh, try to classify that. And as you can see, for the, the tricks that's less than 540 degrees, so uh, one and a half rotations, our accuracy is quite high at 95%. For all, everything, you know, including all every the higher difficulty tricks, our accuracy is at seventy eight percent, and so that puts us like you know anything above seven twenty uh, rotation, 
we're still working on that. It's still not as accurate as it is at 61%, but, um, but at least, you know, this is one way that we can, uh, you know, we're, we're using this to detect, we can, we can be quite confident in detecting any tricks that's, uh, you know, less than uh, 540 degree uh, rotations. I mean, can I just, uh, sorry to interrupt, but I was wondering if I could just ask a, a question, uh, if you could just go back to the previous slide. So the, so the jumps, to detect the jumps, you're basically, is that the, the vibration from the ground that you're losing in that signal, and that's how you recognize what a jump is? So, yeah, I mean, you're going to get a lot of noise from the vibration. The moment that they're in, so what we're detecting is, detecting them in the air. Because the moment they're in the air, then uh, you will be there, no. Well, you're gonna be able to see first, they're gonna go up a ramp. So they're, they're, the acceleration is gonna decrease. And the moment they're up in the air, you're gonna see uh, in one of the axes, there's gonna be uh, you know, a gravity pull from them. Uh, right. That's why, that's how we're detecting the jump. That's, that's fascinating. Um, yeah. Another question uh, from Tom Logan. Uh, can you then use data like these to identify factors that relate to successful slash high rated jumps or unsuccessful slash low rated? Or do you just try to predict the mean judge score? No, that's, this is awesome. Like that's exactly what we're doing is right now. Th this is just one side of um, analysis we've done. We've looked into as well trying to, you know, for all these different tricks, trying to quantify the demand of each type of tricks as they get more difficult, obviously. And then we can start looking at different comparisons of, let's say, gender. Let's say uh, different levels of athletes from national team to next gen. And uh, then right now we have one of the, uh, one of our project is looking directly into the judging scores which looking at what now, we can now truly identify the key, key performance factor that influence, you know, that, that can affect the, uh, that closely relate to the uh, judging score. So in essence, is performance right now, right? So, so yeah, th these are all the different areas that we're, we're getting into and it's, uh, and it's exciting, yeah. And, and so that's why like this work right here, is the data processing for specific metrics that we're pulling out that allows us to do more in-depth analytic work later. And that's, this is exactly why I, I've stressed to many different sports that doing, doing the, uh, the data processing sports specific metrics calculation is so important for, for analytics. Yeah, great. Okay, so Tom says, excellent, thanks. I just have a quick follow-up question then. Have you ever, like, have you had these devices on the riders and suppose the analytics show that, you know, they hit, they had a really good jump, but the judges' scores didn't mat align with that. Like, can you detect judge bias or errors uh, in scoring? I Yeah, um, so that's one of the things that we're looking at is as well, is uh, looking at the judging bias to understand, you no. Know, because there are four different areas for judges have to uh, score. There's the amplitude, the, the difficulty, the landing, and uh, the execution, right? And as we know, any judging sport, any human will have bias towards something. You know, you know as much as we want to try to be as objective as we can, uh, there's always a bias. And so uh, we can definitely do that, you know, trying to identify that. Um, but what one thing that I'm trying to you know re relate to them is that things like amplitude that shouldn't be a judging metric, especially from a judge from judges uh, boot who what's you know it's a hundred meters to two hundred meters away. One cannot possibly identify or differentiate the difference between uh, you no, know, maybe even a foot higher or lower. And so that has to be a, 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 an objective measure. And I'm trying to, trying to validate that right now in the process of validating that. And hopefully we can push that forward and try to maybe have that more of a objective thing than, than a, a 
judging, you know, uh, subjective uh, metrics, right? Yeah, that'd be really cool. Thanks very much. Cool. So lastly, I want to just touch on uh, another project that we're, we've been doing is, uh, is you know, using the sensors to look at the kinematic movements of um, roller ski or cross-country skiing. Um, uh, no, roller skis is, is a very, uh, is another, it's a very close, uh, it has a very close movement as cap, uh, as the uh, cross-country skiing. And a lot of them train on roller skis when they're um, off, you know, off snow. And so what we're trying to do here is looking at the movements of their upper body and lower body by capturing the pole movement and the skate movement. And uh, right now in this figure is just, uh, I'm just showing you the, the actual, just the pole movement. And we're able to just like identify the different points. When the pole leaves the ground into upswing motion and then the downswing motion. And then when they impact the floor and the time they spent on the floor. So it's basically there are three phases, upswing, downswing, and the uh, time on the ground. And we want to try to understand how uh, cadence, for example, uh, is being you know, impacted, right? Or being affected. How, how this, these different phases uh, impacts the cadence. Because we know those three phases are determines what cadence is. And you know, so we want to know what, what are the biggest contributors. And this is what we've done is once we quantify, we tag all these different points, we're able to determine that downswing time accounts for most of the changes in cadence. And, and that kind of makes sense, right? And uh, because, uh, and, and so in this test, we did a three minutes all out test. And uh, it, this is just a, a uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's a standard, it's, a, it's becoming more, more popular, especially in, the, in these days, to be able to, to do a physiological test, uh, an all-out phys physiological test to determine different uh, physiological parameters. And so, so we did a three-minute test looking at the, uh, the, the, essentially, we want to look at what is the force or the power, the you know, decrease of, of, the, uh, of the athletes. And we also noticed that cadence is drops, you know, to to levels off the same way as power. And uh, and if we, you know, like downswing is explains most of the variance, and which makes sense because downswing is literally a surrogate to your force, how much force you're generating into uh, into propulsion, right? The harder you push down, then the, the harder your uh, the essentially the harder the forces, the faster the time spent, the shorter the time spent on the downswing. And so, so that makes sense. That is the part and uh, that generates the force. And we found that with the upswing and ground time on ground did not differ as much. And so, uh, so that's one of the you know, results that came out of that. Um, so I think, yeah, and that's that's the end of my presentation. Uh, I want to obviously thank a lot of uh, the sport that participated with uh, that we work with and as well as the institutions, Simon Fraser, you know, SFU with Dave and um, at U of T with Tim and as well as, uh, you know, I want to thank OTP for a lot of the funding to allow us to, to, to really uh, pursue all these really interesting and exciting projects. Um, so thank you. All right, great stuff, uh, Ming. Thanks very much for uh, a really interesting uh, talk. Um, so we're gonna get into some questions and uh, there is uh, one in the chat form from uh, earlier in the presentation. So this is from Tim Winooski. So uh, he said he really enjoyed your talk. Um, he has a question. Uh, about the use of computer vision for data collection and how are, do you have projects ongoing where video is the source of uh, your data? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, we, uh, we are starting, um, no, we, we ha there is a project like, on, uh, going on right now on post estimation. 
So essentially, you're trying, you know, for those who don't know, uh, post estimation is we're essentially drawing, you know, using videos and you're putting, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say, you know, stick figures on, you know, on these uh, athletes. And from there, we're able to track their movement and it be able to calculate the, uh, you know, let's say, again, the similar metrics, like let's say the twist, the speed, the takeoff speed, the all the different things that, you know, we can capture as much as we can, right? And uh, the appealing, the, the appeal to using computer vision or that, you know, post estimation method is that we don't have to have sensors on athletes anymore, especially with, with the, uh, a lot of times, we want to understand how other competitors, you know, our competitors are doing certain things, right? And so this allows us to quantify metrics from other, you know, our competitors and also from, let's say, the best in the world. If we, our athletes are not already the best in the world, then we can see what is the gap that we need to, 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 to address for us to get there, right? And so, yeah, no, this is um, an exciting area that I'm, um, that, no. I have a project on with, uh, with you know, right now going on. So, yeah. And we'd definitely love to explore more with, uh, you know, at SFU if there are people who are interested in this area, for sure. Well, I think, uh, yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to recruit some computer vision experts to speak within this series because it's certainly one of the frontiers, uh, you know, and it's a good link between kinesiology and, and, and you know, analytics because, uh, you know, in biomechanics, machine learning of computer vision uh, you know, is uh, a big area for move, movement analysis, as you're probably aware. Um, okay, I'm going to ask a question. So you talked about, um, you know, a lot about sport specific metrics. And so when you when you first introduced it uh, in the processing part of your talk, you, you sort of showed some graphs and some tables. I guess that my question is like, for those the biathlon example like in rifle steadiness or for the para athletes uh, in their push uh, mechanics like what are, what are the actual summary metrics that you derive from those data that quantify rifle steadiness so you know we could see like that really nice image the, the animation of how the rifle like presumably how the barrel is moving i'm guessing um and uh you know, so I'm wondering, um, yeah, what are you qu actually quantifying from that to get, because like, presumably coaches want a summary score, right? Uh, or to the extent possible, like what, you know, you want a number, uh, yeah. whether or not that's possible or valid is, uh, you know, is, is another matter. But yeah, I'm curious. So uh, yeah, so, if you could just go take us through that. So what I've done uh, for the rifle steadiness is uh, obviously it's 2D, right? You know, you're, you're looking at just uh, left and right up and down and so what uh, what I did there is looking at the movement of the left and right and up and down how how much movement they they are moving and you no know, for uh, you know so what I've done there in terms of the the steadiness score is essentially the standard deviation of the uh, of the movement on I, I you know I separate them out as just vertical movement and then horizontal movement and then the overall movement which is just the resultant of the um, you know the boat right and so i use the standard deviation as their steadiness um, metrics and um and separating separating them by different phases so there's a uh, two sec point two uh well two seconds uh, more than 0.6 seconds out so essentially looking at 0.6 to two seconds. And then there's 0 0.2 to 0 0.6. And then from the moment of just before the shooting to 0.2 and then post, post shot. So it's, we wanna see if, do you get more steady as you get closer and closer to the moment of shot? And then what happens when you, um, after you shoot? Because the reason we wanna know that is if the, so this is what I learned from them is that when the rifle is not weighted properly, the, after you shoot, there's going to be a lot of recoil. And so, and not, so that's the recoil acceleration is also quantified. It's just how much, you know, you, you, the, the, the rifle recoil. So 
if the, the rifle is balanced well, then the recoil should be uh, smaller. And so same, so, so is the, uh, the steadiness. And so that, that, those are the metrics that I quantify for them. That's, uh, that's fascinating. So the different colors then are the different phases of the, the right. shot, I assume? That's right. And I, so, I get, yeah. yeah and, exactly. and so have you validated, like you, you talk about validating this metric. I mean, it seems fairly intuitive uh, what you're talking about, but is, you know, does that standard deviation give you what you want? Well, if we think about what standard deviation is, it's essentially just how much points are within this, you know, one standard deviation, right? So if you're moving a lot, or so your standard deviation is really wide, then that means you're, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're not quite as steady. If you're, if you're just not moving, then your standard deviation will be really, really tight, right? Mm -hmm. So um, based on that logic, I don't know how, how one could, really uh, validate that steadiness um, metrics. But what we're in the process of trying to validate is actually the, the actual accuracy of the movement itself. So then that is the part that we need to validate um, standard deviation site or the steadiness uh, score. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure how to validate that. It's just a metric that we, we quantify and uh, to, to capture how much movement it is. So. Yeah, I, I guess maybe, I mean, uh, just a bit, yeah, like, so are, you know, are those who are more steady actually more accurate in their shooting and, or, you know, because, and then oh. I guess, um, you know, as you're setting up for the shot, you know, there is going to be some, they, they do have to like, you know, they're on, they're on their fronts, they have to like steady the rifle to find the target. And I don't know, I mean, you, you, these timelines are pretty short. So I guess that maybe all this happens before the phases that you're actually looking at here. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's sort of what I'm thinking. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, we haven't, like, we, we just started this, uh, you know, capturing all, all these different rifle, like with biathletes, right. Uh, maybe, maybe three, just three, three camps or three testing, uh, camps. And so, uh, we don't quite have enough data yet to, to do more, uh, just deeper, you know, to dig deeper into the, uh, that relationship, but, I think after you no, know, and um, well, we you know this uh, COVID thing is throwing things in a little bit of a wrench. But uh, as we start getting more data, that's one thing we're going to look into. Definitely trying to trying to see if there's any some relationship there, and uh, you know, and and if it differs between guys who are at different levels, right? And uh, or or if uh, one thing to look at is even what is your reload time, like the the time that you shoot, like shot between shots like should you take more time risk no because this is a game of uh as well like game of uh time right the faster they they cross the finish line that the better it is but are you willing to give up a little bit more time for accuracy you know is some then that becomes an, an, an interesting optimization uh you know uh algorithm right because if you miss a shot you're gonna have to do extra penalty lap but is it Better to just like take five really really quick one, miss them all, and just do your laps, and then make up all that. I, I you know it would be interesting, right? So, yeah. So, and, and have you looked at any relationships between steadiness, like over the course of a race or a training session, where fatigue would be entering in, or you know, and or the association between heart rate uh, yeah. or maybe perceived exertion and steadiness? Yeah, I know we haven't looked at that because they only shoot once. Or, I mean, twice. One is prone, one is standing, and uh, prone is beginning. So, in generally, the, the, the competition format is they would do a lap of uh, roughly, I don't know, seven minutes, eight minutes, roughly around there. They'll do the prone shooting, do another same lap, same loop, and then they'll do the stand, and then they do another, finish it off with another loop, right? And so, it's hard to make comparisons between the standing and the prone because, as you mentioned, during the standing, obviously, then it's by nature, it's already less stable. Right. And then you add on top of that fatigue because they've done two laps already. The fatigue factor factors into that. And uh, versus now, if you can compare it to just uh, a prone shooting, they've only done one lap. They're you know, fresher, obviously, than, than when they're standing. And so, uh, so it's hard to compare that. I, 
I don't, yeah, I, I may no, maybe it will be interesting to see, um, to, to, to device some, some study to look at the, you know, to actually have a proper uh, intervention on the, these different, to look, to actually look into the different fatigue level on shooting steadiness, right? Yeah. That's uh, that's really insightful. Uh, yeah, I don't know biathlon that well, so that, that's a good uh, good to know that 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 or to ha have that explanation. Um, so I'll have another sort of related question. So you talked about you know metrics sometimes reflecting a coach's philosophy, and so obviously there's a conversation that happens where you and the coach have to decide what you're actually going to look at. Have there been times where you know is there disagreements, or is it really usually a pretty collaborative effort where? You know, and, and there's sometimes where you're like, you know, I don't think that metric that you know in your maybe back of your mind that metric, you know, a certain metric proposed by the coach, and you just know that it's not going to be that useful. Uh, maybe you collect it anyway. Um, but yeah, can you to describe the conversations and how they go when uh, you're devising these metrics with the coaches? Oh, and Ming seems to have lost. We seem to have lost the connection there. Oh, oh, there we're back. Good. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, did you uh, did you hear my question? Yeah, yeah. Oh, perfect. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I think that's a great question. Um, I no, I I have generally a lot of times like that's the that's the consultation part with the coaches, is uh, trying to understand what are the things that they want to capture and understand what's important to them. A lot of the time, I what I've found is they can articulate what they're looking for, especially you know the uh, you know the the sport that hasn't been introduced to technology or sports science a lot. Uh, you no, know, uh, they 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 know a lot of the you know they they can look at things based on their experience and their their uh, you know their 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 knowledge, and they can tell you that, but they don't know how to capture what they're, you know, they're, they're, they're looking, you know, what they're, the things that they're looking at. And so, so that's where I find myself having to really try to understand what they're talking about. And not just what they're talking about. And a lot of times is you have to actually be there and observe that, that sport to really under, truly understand, uh, you know, what, what the, the sport like really do some study of the sport. And I think that's where, and a lot of times it, it will take me, you know, a few days or even a lot of times like months to, to really understand it before I can really try to, try to come up with some metrics that will potentially capture what he or, you know, the coaches want, right? And, and of course there's always gonna be back and forth dialogue. And, and trying to explain this metrics I'm quantifying, does that sound you know, right to what, you know, because a lot of times hearing what the coach's uh, explanation of something, but one or two times, I may not truly understand it still. And that, and is that iterative uh, process of brainstorming, going back and forth and being immersed in that sports a little bit longer, allows you to truly be able to, to understand that, right? Um, of course, there's a lot of uh, knowledge transfer that you can relate to other sports and trying to bring, bring that from the other sport. But, but sometimes, like, you know, if you're just dealing with some really different sport, then, then I, I find that you just have to be there and really be immersed in that. Um, sometimes you, you deal with coaches that are um, more technically minded and they may provide some suggestions and different things that you can quantify. Um, I've, I've had discussions and, uh, or, or, uh, or you no know, discussions with coaches that, that will propose something or, or that, that I don't agree with. Um, that, that becomes a really tough, uh, discussion that you know it can be a tough to discussions at times right um sometimes they just think that they do know something but 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 no but sometimes maybe it may not be the right metrics based on just the the theory or the 
uh, you know, physics of it. And, uh, and sometimes you just have to be, you just have to politely <laughs> disagree. <laughs> um, and like you said, if they insist, you, you, you could, you know, you, you, you just collect. And, uh, and if you really, you know, and sometimes if I just truly believe it's just not a useful thing, um, I, I, I will just uh, politely just, you know, tell, tell the coach that I, I just don't think this is a useful thing. And I don't think that I want to be engaged in, uh, in this uh, either quantification, you know, to help them quantify this or, or, or further whatever project that may be, because I just don't think it's, it's the right thing for, for our institute to participate because, you know, we truly want to make sure that we're doing this sport just, you know, the right justice, right? Like trying to make sure that they're doing, that we're providing a value add, not just because we're doing it for, you know, just to, to, to have uh, some, some, you know, funding going our way, right? And, and, I, and I think we need to, to, to have that in the back of our mind that we're trying to, we have to kind of provide that value add regardless uh, not not just for the money. We're not doing it just for the money. Yeah, yeah. Great. Um, so, like, it sounds like just to you know kind of summarize what you've been saying. Like, there's the you know there's constructs, which probably the coaches thinks in terms of constructs, like thing you know things that they can they know exist, concepts, uh, you know, abstract entities. But you're what you need to do is operationalize those into things that can be actually be measured. And I think that's a that's a general scientific challenge actually. That again, for the students on the call, like. You know, if you you want to be a scientist, uh, you know that's what you you know one of the main skills uh, involved. Um, I'll just ask one last question. Uh, I haven't seen anything in the chat form uh, from anyone else, uh, so I guess I'm kind of monopolizing this, but uh, unapologetically. Um, so, what metric are you most proud of developing? Which one do you think like is the coolest thing that you've uh, you know that you've uh, developed? Um. I don't think like I don't think there's any like anything I do that that you know that amazing or that great like I mean uh, you know and, and especially I think in in our sport or I mean in, in our sports system we're not quite at a place where we are looking into such a in-depth analytics uh, all, you know with all these like things like we what I'm trying to say is we haven't taking care of all the, you know, the basics and the fundamentals, the making sure that things are done, quantified, right, done, right, or captured properly, you know, yet. And so I think what I'm most proud of in terms of you know, my value add to the system right now is the biggest push I have I've been doing is trying to bring inferential statistics into the system and trying to get people to think a little bit more than just your descriptive data or analysis and then trying to make decisions based on that. And so that's where I feel like what I've done the most in trying to advance our, our, our sports system. And, and as you, you are a big part of that as well. Like you, you know, you're a big advocate is that we talk a lot about it is, and that's what we're doing right now with, uh, with our, uh, you know, OTP initiative is trying to upskill the, uh, the practitioners in this data literacy area. And that's where I find that I you know my, my contribution is, and I feel more, most proud about that. Um, in terms of, you know, doing, you know, with the daily training stuff, with the different sports, um, I feel like the IMU project has been the really, you know, big component, like a big contribution to many different sports to open their you know, uh, segues into so many different areas, into let's say uh, low monitoring for a lot of these different sports so that they can use it for uh, return to sport. Injury you know, monitoring, because now in the past, they, uh, they would just go out there and just do their thing. But now we actually can objectively quantify that and looking at the loading and then progressively, you know, increase the loading based on their response and working with the physios, right? And medical teams, um, training their, you know, quantifying the load monitoring there. That has 
usually, you know, usually has been just a very subjective thing in these freestyle sport where you're just three hours on the mountain, three hours on the mountain. That's my training load. You could be in the chalet for three hours, you know, just sipping hot chocolate for three hours, or you can be on the slope for doing jumps on through for three hours. Totally to very different loading, but it's the same to them before it's just three hours. Similarly, if, even if you count number of jumps, you know, you can do 50 jumps of just little bunny hops versus 20 of some huge, huge jumps. We would argue 20 jumps is way more taxing than to your body than, than the 50 jumps, right? But if you just count jumps, you will just probably, you know, say the 50, that's 50 jumps is gonna be uh, a lot more than 20. And, and so that's why I think with this IMU initiative in the freestyle sport has really transformed the way, you know, uh, how they quantify that. And, and this is just the beginning, right? Yeah. This will open doors to so many different areas. And this is not just freestyle sport, like in every sport, like para sport. Uh, just, and this is another big area that, you know, we as an industry has been putting a lot of effort there is trying to get into the para game now, trying to essentially with all these different sports, we're trying to understand the demand of that sport. And once we understand the demand, then we can actually now come up with a systemic intervention to identify key performance indicators and then systematically target these different indicators to enhance our performance, right? Yeah, no, that's uh, that's really great. Um, I think that's a that's a, a, a great place to end on. Um, very passionate. Uh, uh, and uh, I think you do have a lot of lot to be proud of in the in the short time that you've been in the system. There's been a lot of change that that I've seen certainly. So, uh, congratulations on that. And uh, so we're going to end here. I'm just going to uh, thank Ming uh, once again. So, uh, and uh, hopefully, uh, if anyone has any follow up questions or discussion, uh, we'll stay on for maybe another ten minutes or so after I stop the recording. Uh, but with that, I will conclude today's session, and uh, we'll see everybody uh, on November 13th, I believe. Check the website just to be sure though. Thanks.